tonight I want to uh, talk to you and encourage you with one of our um, one of our sisters in the Bible, and um, her name is Esther. Um, and uh, I love the Book of Esther. Uh, it's every time I feel like every time I read it, I get something new out of it. And sometimes I get the same principle, but just a deeper level of it. And so I feel like that's what happened this last time that I was in when I was reading the book of Esther. Um, and so why? Why am I talking about Esther tonight? Well, first of all, because every book, every chapter, and every word in the Bible has purpose. So we could get up here and talk about anything in the Bible, and there is a purpose to that. Um, some books give history, like Esther. It's a book of some history. Um, and some books of the Bible speak of the future, what's coming up. Um, some Bible, some books of the Bible give instructions on what to do and what not to do. And some, um, are prime examples of what to do and what not to do. It's just the story. And you're like, how do I relate to this? Um, I'm not going to do that. You know what I mean? Like you're reading the Bible sometimes and you're like, ooh, that was, yeah, not doing that, not going to go there. But basically it's Second Timothy 3.16 that says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful, useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what's right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So why Esther? Well, because she's in the Bible. She's a great, (laughs) she's an amazing uh, example of things that I'm going to talk about tonight. And um, I want to highlight some things in her life that we, that applies to us today. That's what's so cool about the Bible is that a lot of times you can relate what was going on in Bible days sometimes are going on now. And also the word helps us to see God in maybe a way that we didn't see him before we read the Bible. And so tonight we're going to talk about her. So who is Esther? Um, raise your hand. Just, just like, I just want to, if you have read the book of Esther, just like I've read it before, read it before. Okay, cool. Almost everybody. And that's cool. Um, but I want to remind you of who she is, but also those of you who may be like, I'm not sure. I don't remember. I'm going to tell you about her. So Esther, um, her story is found in the book of Esther. She has a whole, her own book, which is super cool. Um, she was an orphan whose, whose parents had, had died and her, um, cousin raised her. Her cousin, his name was Mordecai. Um, she was a woman of the diaspora, which was the scattering. So she was a descendant of the Jews who had been scattered among the nations at the time of the exile. They had an exile. Some Jews went here, some Jews went there. So she was, you know, part of that. Uh, She was a descendant of that. She was also chosen as queen after the king became displeased with his wife. Um, I'll get more into that in a little bit. She also is known for following the wisdom of her uncle. I did a little study on uh, the way her uncle discipled her. And it was really quite, it was really cool to see the ways that he discipled her. He just wasn't just her, I say uncle, y'all, I call him her uncle all the time. It's her cousin. That's how in Cajun country, your cousins that are older than you, they're your aunts and uncles. And my brain always says uncle Mordecai. Like I talk about him, like he's our uncle. So if I say uncle, he's really her cousin. <laughs> I, I hear myself saying it. Um, anyway. Okay. So her cousin, he, um, yes. He raised her. He discipled her. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, it's really interesting to see the parallels in things that he taught her and how she went on to do those things. It's just super cool. So I encourage you to, you know, when you read Esther, to look at it in that mindset of how did her cousin disciple her? Um, yes. Okay. And then the wisdom that he gave to her, it, she followed that wisdom and it in turn caused her people to be saved, which we'll talk about that too. Um, just giving you an overview. And she is one of the only two women in the Bible that has a book written after them. So that's really neat. Um, I do want to take a minute to also tell you how she became queen. She was an orphan and she became the queen, which 
That just goes to show, before I start the recap of that, that it doesn't matter who you are. We serve a great God, and he can do great things with his children. So if anybody in here ever doubted that God could use you to do something great or put you in a great place, this will just dispel that right away. She was, her people were exiled, her parents died, So she could look at herself as, I am a nobody. I've been rejected. I've been abandoned. However, God had a plan, and he has a plan for you and I. And so that, we could just start out with that encouragement, that it doesn't matter how lowly you think you might be, God has the final say. And because he is great, he can cause us to do great things. So quick quick recap of how she became queen. So King Xerxes, I don't know a better way to say his name. So if there is a better way, you could share it with me after. Uh, some of these names in the Bible, y'all, they're just hard, okay? Um, this man, this king threw a party for 180 days. Have you ever partied that long? I mean, oh my gosh, that's, I want to say it came out to like six months. Maybe I'm wrong, but 180 day, thank you. 180, you did the math real quick like that. See, yeah, good job. <laughs> so anyway, he threw this six month party, right? So at the party, he was so generous. He gave, and you could read it all in the book of Esther. He gave like, oh, drink, be merry, you know, whatever you want. He was just generous, inviting people. I mean, just whatever. And at this party, he decided he wanted to show off his wife, the queen. He wanted her to put her crown on and parade around and show all the men how lucky he was as, as, as a king to have this beautiful babe. However, she refused. She was like, I ain't doing that. And um, he got super mad. The Bible says he, he, got, re- he got really mad. And he sought his advisors to ask them, what do I do about this woman who refused to obey me? Um, and they had the great idea to make an example out of her and dispose of her and find a new queen. So that's exactly what he did. Done with you. You didn't obey me. I'm going to find me a new queen. So after he gathered all the eligible ladies of the land... Um, he put them through this preparation p- process, pretty much like a beauty pageant, but it lasted a really long time. Um, and then he chose Esther. Esther was one of those little ladies that he brought in the palace and, you know, she got treated right. She got prepared and everything else. And he chose her. After she becomes queen, uh, she hears the plan to annihilate her people and her, cause she is a Jew, all the Jews, which it was, The king's right-hand dude, Haman, hated the Jews, so he wanted them dead, that he wanted them all dead. And the king agreed to it because he didn't know any better, I guess. Uh, Let's read, read the book of Esther and you can come to your own conclusion about King Xerxes. Um, so in a desperate attempt to stop the genocide, her cousin gives her the advice on how to possibly save her people, right? Um, She's super scared, which we'll get into that later. She's really scared about it, but she follows through and ends up giving her people a chance to be saved. This story is amazing. Like, I'm reading this, and I'm like, y'all, some people are, like, still watching soap operas. Like, to, like my grandma watched that, and some of you may still watch it. But listen... That can't hold a candle to the stories in the Bible and what God has to say. And I'm not just talking about drama because this story is very full of drama, but I'm talking about depth and, and like you get into it. Like I know you cannot watch the soaps for like years and you walk in the room and your grandma or your aunt is watching it and you're like, Oh my gosh, I remember him from like when I was 12. He's still, he's still around. And, and it just, they, tries to get you in there. You know, those shows, not just the soaps. I mean, I'm talking Bachelorette. I'm not calling anybody out for watching, but it's like these shows, they they just grab you and you just have to watch the next episode, right? Look, y'all, the Bible has so much meat and so much fullness in it. It, It's so good. And so the next time you're tempted to go watch something that just, you know, pets your flesh, Think about the word, y'all. Go get in the word. It's good stuff. And this is one of my favorites. Esther's is so good. So 
I want to talk about three lessons we can learn from Esther. There are many, like there are many. And, and just as I'm talking and sharing with y'all, y'all might, y'all are going to probably think of a few lessons that I don't mention. And that's awesome. I'd like to hear them. But, but I just kept it down to three because these were the three that really stuck out to me this last time I was in the book of Esther. And so the first one is she saw the value in preparation. Esther saw the value in preparation. Um, preparation by definition is the action or process of making ready or being made ready for use. Also something done to get ready for an event or an undertaking. Undertaking, that's preparation. In Esther 2.12, it says, before each young woman was taken to the king's bed, she was given the prescribed 12 months of beauty treatments, six months with the oil of myrrh, followed by six months with special perfumes and ointments. 12 months of preparation. And let me remind you that we know the end of the story, but she did not. So January, each month, each month that came, each week that came, she is preparing herself not knowing if she is going to actually become the queen or just one of his concubines. Think about that. And some of you, you're like, I can relate. I can relate with preparing and preparing and getting ready and praying and seeking and asking and serving. And I don't know if I'm going to, I don't know if I'm going to get what I'm really wanting. I don't know if I'm going to get that thing that I'm working so hard for. But the good news is, is Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that God causes everything, every preparation, every prayer, every time you sit down to read your Bible, every, every praise and every time you get into praise and worship, God works everything to the gather when you fall. When you try and so hard and you mess up, when you make a mistake, when you say that ugly thing to that person, you're really trying to and praying for restoration in the relationship. God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God. So you got, you have to be loving God and are called according to his purpose. If you love him, you are called according to his purpose, ladies. And we have to remember that the good news is that in the preparation, when we're getting ready, when we're spending that time with the Lord, when we mess up, the good and the bad, he uses it all. Sometimes we want to think he just uses, like, we're like, oh, he uses everything to work together. So is that like just the good stuff I'm doing? No, it's the good, the bad, and the ugly. He uses everything. And so I think somebody came here tonight just to hear that. Tonight, you need to know that he is working everything out for the good for you because you love him and you're called according to his purpose. So why should we be a woman of preparation in here, us sitting in here tonight? Why? Because he has a purpose for each one of us. We were created on purpose for a purpose. I've been saying that since we were in youth ministry and I will say that till my dying day. We were created, every person in here, if you can hear me, you were created on purpose. Like he, it wasn't an accident. It wasn't just like, whoops, there's Cassie. No, it was like intention. I created her to be five foot tall and nothing more. She will never, ever, ever be taller than five foot. And that's how I want her, right? It's exactly what he did and exactly what he said. But he, he has a purpose for us. He has a calling for us. You are called. We are called. We have assignments. There are specific things that I'm going to do that you won't. And there are specific things that you're going to do that I won't. You know, an example, some people get calling and assignment. They're like, wait, what's the difference? The example is, is like, okay, Felicia. Felicia is called to lead worship. Couldn't we agree? She is called to make music. She is, that is, her, God has gifted her. It is obvious and she is working in it. But tonight, the assignment was for her to be with us, was for her to be here leading us in worship. She could have been assigned to another church tonight. And I mean, that would have been fine. She'd have had to find me somebody else. But 
Tonight, her assignment was here. And I am very thankful for that. And that's what it is. And I don't want you to get discouraged if you know your calling, but you haven't gotten your assignment yet. Because a lot of times we see the giftings we have. We know the giftings we have. Someone may even say, oh my gosh, you are so gifted in this. And you're looking around like, man, I'd like to use it. I'd like to have an assignment. Where's my assignment, God? And it's crickets. (laughs) You're not hearing anything. But it's okay. You're in the preparation time. Don't despise the preparation. Value it. We must value the preparation time. Um, so his purpose and his calling there, but your assignment may be coming soon, but keep your ears open. Okay. Um, in Ephesians 2.10, and I, I, I like the, how the ESV said this. So that's what we put on the screen. It says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He has created us. We are created, first of all, in Christ Jesus for good works. Listen, if you're not in Christ Jesus, I cannot guarantee that your work will be good. The only way to guarantee our work is going to be good is if we are in Christ Jesus. Some of you in here tonight, you may not be in Christ Jesus. You may not have surrendered your life to Jesus. And tonight, you can do that. Tonight, whenever we are here at the altar and asking if anybody wants prayer, I want you to come up to us and say, hey, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I want to be in Christ Jesus. And it says that God prepared the work beforehand. So God prepared the work. So we must be prepared for the work. Now get that? He prepared a work for us. So now we got to prepare ourselves. We can't just sit there and be like, ah, I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to seek wisdom. I'm not going to grow my craft. Listen, let me tell you, ladies, if you have a gift, grow in that gift. Don't just throw it away. Don't just throw your gifts and talents to the side and say, oh, I'm too busy. I can't use that right now. I'm not doing anything. Grow in your gifts. What is it? If you're a writer, write. Even if it's just poems for fun, write. Journal. If you play music, if you play an instrument when you were little, pick it up. Pick it up again. Pray that God makes a way. I get that finances can sometimes prevent you from doing certain things, but God, he, he's so big. He's so great. He can provide a way. If you're good at cooking, let us know. We will, we would gladly like for you to cook for some events. If you're good at cleaning, call me. <laughs> but, but seriously, there's like, so if you teach, if you're a teacher, not, it, it may not, you may not have the assignment right now to be a teacher or to write a book or to write a song, or to play for a band, or a worship team, or fill in the blank. You may not have that assignment, but I believe that God wants us to be preparing ourselves for when that assignment comes. Y'all got it? Y'all got it? Okay. Um, all right, where are we? He is prepared. Okay. We are preparing for the work, because he prepared the work for us, so we must prepare ourselves for the work. Okay. Um. Next, we're going to read uh, Esther 4.14. Now, let me recap. I'm going to recap what's going on by this point. So Mordecai, her cousin, tells her, hey, there's a plan for the Jews to be annihilated, and you need to do something about it. And she's like, oh, my gosh, you know, like, I'm scared. And he's like, you need to go talk to the king. And she's just like, oh, my gosh, if, you know, like, if I go to the king, he could kill me if, because that's how it was back then. If you went to the king and he didn't want to see you, he could kill you right there. So she knows this. He says to her, Mordecai says to her in Esther 4, 14, it's the second part of the verse. He says, who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this? You know, her um, purpose, she knew she had purpose. She just didn't have the assignment yet. She knew it was something great. She went through the preparation and the purpose fueled her preparation, 
But the preparation came before the purpose was unfolded. And that's what I really want us to get from this lesson. If we can value the preparation, then when the purpose unfolds, we will be ready. When we get that assignment, when that opportunity comes up, we will be ready because we prepared ourselves. So lesson one, she knew the value of preparation. Lesson two, she saw the importance of prayer. So right after Mordecai told her that, right after he said, perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this, Look what she does in four, chapter 4, verse 16, Esther 4, 16. It says, she's passing the word to Mordecai. She says, go and gather together all of the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. If I must die I must die. So Mordecai went away and did everything as Esther ordered him to do. Listen, when she was faced with the, with the, the possibility of death, when she knew she had to risk her life for the sake of her people, what did she do? She called them to pray. And she prayed as well. And not just one person, (laughs) not just a couple friends. She's like, oh, everybody, everybody, we all need to pray. And obviously she knew the power of prayer because that's why she wanted all those Jews to pray for her is because she knew that there was power in prayer. And she prayed that God would intervene, and he did. He did what they prayed for. You know, Uh, At this point, she goes into the king's court and he welcomes her. After she prayed, three days later, she she puts on her robes. She gets ready because she knows that there's a she has to get prepared to go in his presence. She invited him and Haman to a banquet. Remember, Haman is his little right hand man that one of the Jews annihilated. Okay, Um, so she invites them to actually two banquets. She invites them to one banquet, kind of you know like prepares the way and is like hey come to another banquet but let me let me just remind you at this point or or make note that the king loved banquets that man had a six month banquet so she okay has been praying and she has been preparing when she was in the palace for a whole year getting oils and perfumes she was learning about the king and what he liked. Now, it probably didn't take a rocket scientist to know that the man liked banquets because, again, held a six-month banquet. However, she knew. So the prep. this is where the preparation and the prayer gets married, and that produces wisdom, okay? Because she knew what she needed to do. She knew, I need to invite him to not one but two banquets. She thought, it's going to take him two banquets to really get ready to hear what I got to tell him. <clears throat> At the second banquet is when she told him of Haman's plot against her people. At that point, the king's like, wait, what? That's my, that's my queen. So, uh, Haman, he executed Haman. Um, and then he made a decree that the Jews could actually fight and defend themselves. So the first decree that went out, by the way, I don't know if you know, but back in that day, Huh. Once a decree, once a king made a decree, he couldn't change his mind. It's not like today where they can change their mind. You know, we go to a softball game and the, you know, the umpire's like, oh, safe. And then the coach comes on the field and he's like, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, ow. And then the other coach comes, talks to him and he's like, safe. Yeah. That, that doesn't fly back in the, ki- back in those kingdoms. Okay. You, once he made a decree, that was it. So there was already a decree that on a certain day, the Jews were going to get annihilated. But because his queen went and talked to him, and they prayed, she prepared herself to go talk to him. He decides, okay, we're going to make another decree that says all the Jews can defend themselves, which goes to show us that sometimes God's answered prayer isn't just to pull us out of the situation. It's not just to make the thing stop. It's not to, it doesn't just happen like that. Sometimes God's answered prayer is us having to actually do a little work. The Jews had to do, well, they had to do a lot of work. They had to then 
prepare themselves to fight the battle. And a lot of us in here are fighting battles, but we're not going to fight the battles if we're not in the word. We're not going to fight the battles if we're not spending time with the Lord in worship, in prayer, with our focus on. We won't be able to, we got to prepare ourselves to fight the battles and we can only prepare ourselves with him and his word and his wisdom. So the Lord answers the prayer and salvation comes to the Jews. Beautiful. In 1 John 5, 14 and 15 in the ESV, it says, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know we have the requests that we have asked of him. Prayer is important. I want to encourage every, every one of you, if your prayer life is, is maybe struggling a little bit, if you're struggling to pray, I want to encourage you to search out the scripture. Like it is so easy. I mean, they have concordances. I think that's how concordances that you could look and it tells you where to find certain scriptures on certain topics. But I mean, honestly, you could just pick up your phone and Google scriptures on prayer. I dare you to do that. I dare you to take some time and Google some scriptures on prayer and see how much the Bible has to say about prayer. I I encourage you all to do that. I also encourage you, I highly recommend the book that Sister Linda Harding wrote. That's called It's Time to Pray. We have it, we we selling it, and look, I don't get no money off of it, so me telling you this is for your benefit only. We are selling it in the book, in the um, coffee shop. And um, with, if you feel like your prayer life is lacking or you want to take it to another level, I really encourage you to do both of those things. And um, we're going to have 21 days of prayer and fasting coming up in January. I encourage all of you to take part in that because Prayer is powerful and prayer is important. So lesson two, she knew the importance of prayer. Lesson three, she had a heart for her people. In Esther 4.16, in the New Living Translation, it says, the second part of that scripture says, and then, though it is against the law, I will go to see the king. If I must die, I must die. This lady risked was willing to risk her life for her people. That's the kind of love that she had for her people. She didn't eat or drink for three days. She fasted, she prayed because she loved her people. I rec- I had a conversation actually a while back with someone and they were just like, yeah, I'm like, people are always saying they're like praying for this and praying for that. Like they're in a, they're in a fight or a battle and I'm, I'm good. Like, I don't, I'm not, I don't have all these things to pray for. And I'm like, do you know one unsaved person? Because if you know one unsaved person, that's where you start with your prayer. If you, and I mean, God bless you if everything is going super well in your life. I mean, that's what we want. We are here. We live the abundant life. But if your prayer life is not, if you don't have a prayer life because you don't think you don't have anything to pray for, ask God to show you the people around you that need Jesus. And I can guarantee you, you will get a, your, your prayer life is just going to go from zero to a million in no time. When you start crying out for the people around you that need him, she had a heart for her people. She had love. She loved her people. In John 15, 12 and 13, I'm reading this from the amplified um, version. It says, this is my commandment that you love and unselfishly seek the best for one another, just as I have loved you. No one has greater love nor stronger commitment than to lay down his own life for his friends. You know what? This scripture wasn't even written yet. And Esther was living this scripture. And I love how it says, unselfishly seek the best for one another. That's love. When you can seek the best for someone and it may not even benefit you. In fact, it may cause work on you to seek the best for someone else. So I have two questions for you. How has Jesus, because that's what this scripture says. It says, just as I have loved you. 
How has Jesus loved you? I, I really encourage you to think through that. How has Jesus loved me? What has he done for you to show his love for you? If nothing else, ladies, if he did nothing else, he died a criminal's death on the cross, naked for you and I. If nothing else, I know for a fact I would not want to be naked in front of anybody. I don't want to be on no, I, I don't want to be up, I mean like, Seriously, think about it. Like he was, he was naked. Like that's so, that's so embarrassing. And he didn't, he did not sin. He did nothing to deserve it, but he looked at each one of us and said, she's worth it. She's worth it. You're worth it. If you've ever questioned your worth, ladies, tonight, I want to tell you, you have worth. And you are worth it. You are worth it. No matter what you did. That's why he died. He he didn't need to die for a bunch of perfect people. He died for a bunch of sinners. Me and you. You're worth it. So how has Jesus shown his love for you? I challenge you to ask yourself that question. And I challenge yourself to answer that question. How has he shown his love for you? I have another question for you. Who are your people? that you have a heart for? Who are the people that you look around? Who are the people that you see on Facebook that you're just like, or Instagram, that you're just like, ah, my heart goes out to them. Who are the people in your family? Who are the people that you work with? Who are the people that you go to school with? Who are those people that you have a heart for? I encourage you to ask yourself that question. I also encourage you to, encourage you to ask the Lord to show you. And if you don't have not one, pray for just one. Pray for one. God, give me a heart for one person that I can love and I can pray for. So to recap the lessons that we talked about tonight as we close, um, number one, she saw the value in preparation. And let me just tell you that I was so convicted by this. This is not just me. Like, this is for me. Like, this is, like, because of this, things are going to change in my life as well. So this is for, I hope, for all of us. So she saw the value in preparation, and she saw the importance in prayer, and she had a heart for her people. And so what I want to do is I want to have some time to reflect. We have five minutes left. And so what we're going to do is I want, I'd like for, um, as Felicia, she's going to be coming up in a minute and she'll start playing. Um, I would like for my ladies, my altar team to come up here to, so we could offer prayer for some of you. Um, I, I think my altar team can come up now. Staff, altar team. Um, I want you to reflect on this while for the next five minutes. Don't get up. Don't leave. Unless, well, you don't have to go get your kid yet. It's not eight o'clock. Now we have four minutes. If you want prayer, if there's something on here that we talked tonight concerning preparation, your prayer life, uh, our heart for people, or any other thing that you're like, I need a sister to stand with me in prayer, I invite you to come up and let one of us pray for you. For the rest of you, if you can see on the screen, I ask you to just reflect over these questions, maybe take a picture of it for later, write it down, and just just until we close, just let yourself reflect on these questions and and allow the Lord to minister to you through that. So you can come up. If there's anybody that want prayer, please feel free to come up. 